All right, good evening, everybody. We'll just give it a couple uh, seconds more for a few more folks to log in, then we'll get started. I hope everybody's uh, off to a good uh, 2024 uh, so far, and happy holidays to everybody. Hope you had a safe and happy uh, holiday. We know that there's some weather going through uh, North America, so uh, hopefully everybody be safe and, and uh, be well. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the second part of our annual general surgery review course, AppSite Prep. This is um, uh, sponsored through SAGES, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic uh, Surgeons. Um, my name is Michael Awad, and I'm uh, chair of that committee. And um, that's the resident fellow training committee for SAGES, through which this webinar is sponsored. Um, we were excited to kick this off last December with uh, part one, and uh, today we'll continue with uh, part two. I'd like to introduce my uh, co-host for the session today, Dr. Ivy Haskins, um, who will also be um, ushering us through the program today. And we'll also introduce a tremendous panel of uh, expert surgeons who will guide us through each of our sessions today. Good. Next slide, please. So our schedule for this evening, um, again, my name is uh, Michael Awad and uh, Dr. Ivy Haskins and I will usher you through and introduce each of the speakers today. Dr. Uh, James Bittner will go over our first topic of surgical critical care trauma, Dr. Amy Rosenbluth through breast and endocrine, Dr. Sarah Hennessy through a variety of um, uh, topics, and we'll wrap up with Dr. Vipul Katarpal for vascular topics. Um, the society that's sponsoring this again is called SAGES, and I really want to just encourage those of you who are not yet familiar with SAGES or who have not yet become members uh, to engage with this society. It's a phenomenal organization I've been fortunate to be a part of for over 20 years, and, and it's a diverse organization spanning from not just North America, but um, all over the world. Um, next slide, please. With our vision to reimagine surgical care for a healthier world, our, our mission is to innovate, educate, and collaborate to improve patient care. And you can see our values include inclusivity, innovation, service, excellence, a global community, and of course, to have fun. Next slide, please. Um, uh, what are the benefits of joining SAGES? Um, one is our phenomenal annual meeting, which is coming up this spring in Cleveland. We'll talk about that more shortly. You get a substantial discount as um, a member of SAGES. We have amazing webinars, uh, courses, online sessions such as this, and many more that you can um, partake of specific to SAGES members. Um, an expansive network of colleagues throughout the world um, that includes social media groups and other things. You get a free online subscription to our journal, which is Surgical Endoscopy, one of the highest cited journals in um, uh, the field of surgery, as well as many grants, career development awards, committees, task courses, and other things that you can get engaged in. Next slide, please. Um, there are different membership categories, um, and you can see them here. Um, very affordable, um, for, especially for candidate members, medical students, and from those outside of the United States. We have uh, special membership tiers, and I'd encourage you to go and explore um, becoming a member of SAGES if you are not already. Next slide. As I mentioned, SAGES um, is uh, going to be in Cleveland, Ohio, this coming April. Uh, this is... Um, I've seen kind of the program uh, a preview, and it's going to be a phenomenal program, probably one of our best ever. Um, again, a tremendous um, meeting in which there's just a variety of rich um, programming to partake of and really uh, would love to see you there all in person uh, in a few months. So I'd like to hand off to um, Dr. Haskins to kind of tell us a little bit more about tonight's webinar, how it's organized and lead us into the first session. Welcome, Ivy. Thanks, Mike, so much for having me and for um, allowing me to co-chair this session with you. Um, so 
this is just an outline of the absite content. So in January, or excuse me, in December, we did part one of the absite webinar. So we went over the abdomen and elementary tract um, topics. Um, if you miss that webinar, it is available through the Sages YouTube channel for your review. And tonight we're going to be going through part two of our absite um, webinar, which will include multiple topics um, and will kind of cover essentially 100% of the topics covered on the absite. The way that it's going to work is we will go over multiple choice questions and we will have a polling system that we will ask you to participate in. And once um, we get polling from the audience, we will review the answers as well as go over some of the rationals, rationales and the test taking tips. This year, like Mike alluded to, we are using TrueLearn questions and we are super excited to be partnering with TrueLearn. So TrueLearn is a smart bank that has high quality exam style practice questions. Um, and most of the residents who gave us feedback on what question banks they use for the app site really recommended TrueLearn. Um, and so we hope that these questions today are helpful for you guys. And, you know, obviously we'll be going through how to use the TrueLearn format. Um, but for more information, you, you can go to TrueLearn.com. And just again, to remind you for Sages in Cleveland, and we wish you all the best of luck during the app site. So we are going to get started. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen for one second. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Bittner. Um, he is a minimally invasive and robotic surgeon at St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center in Connecticut, where it's currently storming, so stay safe. Um, he is extremely involved in SAGES and the RAFT committee, and we are excited to have him join us tonight. This is the first time for him being faculty, so we're happy to have you, JB. He will be discussing um, surgical critical care and trauma questions, which are always heavily tested on the app site. Very cool. Okay. Um, thank you, Ivy and Mike for having me. First of all, um, I, I totally reiterate uh, what was said about Sages. And I know we probably can't say Sages rocks because we're going to rip off somebody's registered trademark, but um, it, it's it's going to be a great show in Cleveland. Uh, it's going to be at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you're going to get an opportunity to see that if you haven't already. Um, it really is a cool organization designed for a lot of very important purposes, but I think one of the things that makes Sages um, so cool is I know very few national or international organizations that have entire task, task forces designed to reimagining and making more fun um, our discipline, uh, the discipline of surgery. And so I think they have the right idea. And, and so I'm glad to be here to support it. All right, so with that being said, as Ivy mentioned, we're gonna jump into the questions. I'm gonna read the questions. We'll give you a short period of time to answer them uh, and watch the survey responses. When that's done, I'll jump in and talk not only about the correct answer, but also a little bit about some test taking strategies related to each question, especially those questions that might have some disparate answer choices, okay? So with that said, let's get started. Um, you have, a, oh, and also the other thing to mention is I may abbreviate some things and cut some things shorter than what you're reading just to make things a little simpler and save us a little time. So your first question is you have a 35 year old male who's admitted to the ICU following a motor vehicle accident. The ICU nurse calls you to assess heart rate rhythm abnormality seen on a cardiac monitor. The patient's on morphine and propofol drips and Haldol as needed. Lab results from the morning were all normal, including the electrolytes. The blood pressure is 110 over 65. And then there's a rhythm strip shown below. And you can see the rhythm strip there, unless you're like me and you have to zoom in because you're getting older. Uh, Haldol was discontinued after this rhythm strip was seen. What is the best next step in the management? And you can see your answer choices A through E. So go ahead and if you haven't already, 
and start recording your answers. All right. So it looks like the hive mind uh, has chosen B as the answer, about 82% of folks, which is pretty much what we assume to be the case because from a test taking strategy, you can see the right answer is um, magnesium, which is the treatment of torsade to point. But really from a test taking strategy, this is a straight memorization question whereby the question stem in and of itself doesn't really give you a whole lot of information that's useful, it's more a distractor. And what they're trying to ask you here is, do you know that Haldol causes an arrhythmia? What is that arrhythmia and how do you treat it? That's basically what the question boils down to and it's largely a memorization type question. Um, they're gonna get harder obviously with more layers of thought as we move through the questions. Um, but it's good, I think, to know that there are certain ones that are just purely based on memorization, and this happens to be one of those. Um, again, if there's questions as we go along, please feel free to type them in the question and answer session. Um, the other faculty on the list will uh, potentially respond and chime in as we go through this. So now we're going to jump to question number two. A 45-year-old woman presents to the trauma bay after another motor, motor vehicle crash. Um, she presents with her husband who reports that she's taking Coumadin for AFib. Uh, the patient had a focused assessment for sonography for trauma or a FAST exam, which showed fluid around the liver. Her vitals, she has a heart rate of 110, her blood pressure is 90 over 40, and her INR is 2.7. She's been consented for an exploratory laparotomy but requires a reversal of her coagulopathy. What's the recommended reversal agent for this patient? All right, we'll give you a chance to vote. Another another really common app site question. This one's always interesting because um you never, uh, you never, you, 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 we, we often call things by their brand name. So the group again chose primarily B, uh, prothrombin complex concentrate, AKA K-Centra. So I think for those that might not have chosen this one, um, certainly if they would have written K-Centra, I think maybe a certain number of people would have chosen it just based on brand recognition alone. But in addition to that, uh, you can see that the concept here is um, based on the fact that if you're going to reverse Coumadin in a patient with potential bleeding for an emergency or urgent in intervention, um, then what we really need to do is give K-Centra because within 30 minutes, uh, it says less than 60 minutes, but some of the most current studies even say less than 30 minutes, um, you'll have a significant reduction in your INR down to about 1.3, I think was the most recent study uh, within 30 minutes of administration. So it works faster than FFP for, for sure. Um, in my hospital, it can take that long just to get FFP to the patient. So um, the others were largely distractors um, because of the fact that uh, a single agent here is really all that's indicated. So if there's any, there's not a lot of test taking strategy to that one. That's that's also sort of a memorization um, and evidence based answer. So moving on to the next question. We have a 21 year old soldier who is caught in an explosion from a car bomb and a large piece of shrapnel severely injures his anal rectal region. That just sucks. That's an aside, but that's just terrible. There appears to be severe disruption of the internal and external inner sphincters with a large, full thickness rectal injury. The soft tissues around the anus are also severely injured. So what's the next best step in management? 
And you can see as you pick your answer choices here, you've got local debridement and prefacal drainage or a distal rectal washout with a primary repair, a diverting colostomy, a low anterior resection or an abdominal perineal or APR resection. So let's log some votes. And as you think about this, um, first I feel bad for the soldier, but also think about um, one key component of the question stem, which relates to not only severity, but also location. Uh-oh, I think the boat thing went away. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So, um, again, the majority of you, uh, not, not unsurprisingly, uh, picked diverting colostomy. And hopefully the reason you picked diverting colostomy was because of the fact that you recognize the severity of injuries in general. And more specifically, you recognize the location of injury um, being not only uh, extra peritoneal, but potentially even intraperitoneal, and therefore a diverting colostomy is the best way to measure certainly extra peritoneal trauma, um, but also maybe even intraperitoneal trauma should it extend that high. And this largely is a way to control the effluent and allow further exploration of the wound in time, further management, surgical or otherwise, uh, of the extra peritoneal and or intraperitoneal rectal injury it's your, it's your sort of get out of jail free card, if you will, and it allows you to then manage the complex soft tissue injury that's a result of the trauma. You can see over there the, um, the AAST rectal scale injury scale. I actually just did a case um, recently of an um, a intra extra peritoneal rectal tear from a trauma um, using the scale. And so while you may not be asked to resuscitate or to, to uh, reiterate the scale uh, on the app site, certainly understanding the location of injury is important to this question. All right, I think we can jump ahead. Next question, um, a 36 year old man who's an unrestrained intoxicated driver is involved in a head on crash with a tree and requires a prolonged extrication from the car after being pinned against the seat by the steering wheel. Standard uh, ACLS protocol was carried out. Uh, the patient was brought to an emergency department where he was hemodynamically stable and underwent a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and then pelvis. The images of said CT scan showed bilateral pulmonary contusions with fractures of the sternum and se several ribs bilaterally. Which of the following is true concerning blunt cardiac injury? You've got abnormal e, um, ECG, which mandates uh, a 24 to 48 hour observation. You've got all sternal fracture patients need continuous ECG monitoring. All patients with blunt cardiac injury need emergent echo. The presence of sternal fractures increases mortality and cardiac biomarkers should be obtained in all patients. Oh, we might not get all the same answer on this one. That's nice. That makes it more fun. There comes something. So it looks like the majority of um, participants chose A, about roughly half of you chose A. Um, and let's, so we'll come back to that because uh, I want to pick on a few of the other answers for just a minute. Um, certainly from a test taking strategy, your antenna should go up when the answer choice includes the word all, um, because you can almost always think of some reason where that is not always the case. And so read those phrases critically. Uh, in this particular answer stem, B and C and E all have the word all in them. And so already you can hesitate to pick those, uh, even if you didn't entirely understand the answer to the question, which leaves you between A and D. Um, 
And the presence of sternal fractures increases mortality may be true or may not be true. And even if you didn't know the difference, you do know that an abnormal EKG is in fact abnormal. The question stem is telling you that. And abnormality should be further investigated, managed, and or observed. And so uh, the question stem in and of itself wasn't all that useful here. All they're asking you for in some ways is a common sense approach to um, a blunt cardiac injury with an abnormal EKG. All right, next question. Um, a 66 year old man is post-op day two from a left upper lobectomy secondary to lung cancer. He has a history of smoking, diabetes, and congestive heart failure with a recent echo showing an ejection fraction of 30%. He's got progressively uh, flowing in his physical therapy. He's got uh, shortness of breath. He has crackles on auscultation. And the 12 lead EKG that you see below is also obtained at the time. His blood pressure at the time of the EKG is 110 over 80. He doesn't have any chest pain. He doesn't have any worsening shortness of breath. So what is the next step in management? So after looking at the EKG, your answer choices are sedation and cardioversion, uh, metoprolol, magnesium, amiodarone, or a heparin drip. And so when thinking about this question, um, the thought process, everybody's answering this right away. The thought process is, is the image in this instance necessary to answer the question or is it a dis distractor? And I think it's a pretty good idea to think that in this particular one, it's important to the question. And is there anything in the stem that is relevant to the answer or is the stem a distractor as well? Um, and in this instance, I'll just tell you that the, the stem also has some information in it that's relevant to your answer choice. All right, it looks like the majority of folks have voted. Eh, it keeps changing. Um, so you can call it whenever you want, Ivy, but I think it looks like the majority of people actually picked B, um, which is IV metoprolol. And the second most common answer choice was D, amiodarone. So here's the thought process behind this. So first of all, you recognize that the EKG is relevant. And so you try to interpret the EKG. Based on the answer choices alone, um, you can eliminate some right off the bat just by looking at the EKG. You know, IV magnesium is most often used for things like torsade de point, and this is not torsade de point, and therefore probably not the answer. The heparin drip doesn't really um, describe uh, how to treat essentially the EKG. It may be a treatment that you choose to initiate um, based on your diagnosis of the EKG, but it isn't the direct treatment of the EKG abnormality, right? So that you can eliminate E in that way, which leaves you to A, B, and C. Well, A, uh, sedation and cardioversion, let's be honest, is most often used for uh, non-sustainable or irregularly irregular rhythms, your AFib with uh, RVR or your ventricular tachycardia, et cetera. And you can see from the EKG that that's not the case here. So that really brings your answer down to B and D, right? Um, most people would pick B because they would recognize this as atrial fibrillation, uh, but that's where the answer stem becomes important because the answer stem um, notifies you that the patient has CHF and in patients with CHF in order to um, decrease the risk of a negative inotropic effect instead of giving IV beta blocker you're going to give IV amio initially to try to treat the atrial fibrillation uh, in order to get them back to a sinus rhythm so that is the one piece of medical information you sort of need to bring to this question that isn't immediately available by the question stem or the EKG. Dr. Pittner, certainly a lot of uh, kind of rhythm strips and EKGs and uh, on the app site and certainly in this section. Uh, so good that you went over it. Really appreciate your helpful responses. Sorry to interrupt. I know we have a lot more questions to get through in a few more minutes. So thank you.
Yeah, for me, the key is to only use the EKG if I really, really need it in the question, because I don't know about the rest of you, but I ain't so good at reading them and I don't read them very often. And so I really need to know, does the EKG help me answer the question or does it not, right? Um, and so let's jump to the next question because I think there's more EKGs to come. A 35-year-old man sustained a single gunshot wound to the right upper quadrant. Secondary survey reveals a single hole in the anterior abdomen of the right upper quadrant. After initial resuscitation, he remains hypotensive and develops peritonitis. So he's taken emergently to the operating room. How widely should he be prepped and draped? So this should be pretty straightforward. This is sort of a free points on the ab site if you get one of these, because it really doesn't take a whole lot of medical knowledge here. You don't have to retain a a significant memorized Krebs cycle to get this one. Um, so don't overthink it is the key. And JB, if you could just quickly read the responses for those who may not be able sure. to see their phone. Thank you. For sure. So your, your answer choices are um, abdomen only, abdomen and chest, abdomen, chest, and bilateral thighs, abdomen, chest, and neck, and abdomen, chest, neck, and bilateral thighs. Yeah, that didn't take long. There they all are. Mm -hmm. This one looks like, I think most people okay. got, we could probably go through this one pretty quickly. Yep. Oh, for sure. For sure. So this is just a simple, um, a simple tenant of trauma prep, which is basically prep, prep from chin to knees uh, for penetrating trauma of the thorax or, or abdomen. Uh, there's not much more really to talk about. And from a question taking standpoint, uh, it doesn't ever hurt you here to choose um, prepping a, a larger area compared to a smaller area. So I think that's about it for that question. Moving on to the next one. Uh, a 36 year old man presents hypotensive after a high speed motor crash. He's a non-responder to resuscitation. A fast exam is positive in the trauma bay. So he goes right to the operating room for exploration. Whereupon they find a complex pelvic bone and vascular injury. There's diffuse oozing in the sacral venous plexus of the pelvis, but there's no discrete vessel injury. Despite the fact that it's explored, there's still continuous venous oozing um, and the pelvis is packed off. His temperature at the time is 36 degrees Celsius. Labs are notable for a pH of 7.3. Which of the following aspects of this case support a damage control approach to minimize operative time? The answer choices are a temperature of 36 degrees Celsius, a large volume resuscitation greater than eight liters, a base deficit greater than 10, a pH of 7.3, and complex pelvic injury with diffuse venous bleeding. Take a second to answer. Yeah, okay. So it's a little little bit of a mixed bag. So yeah, I think that's most people. So you can see the answer here is a complex pelvic injury with diffuse venous bleeding, but why? Well, uh, first of all, from a test taking strategy standpoint, certain answer choices weren't ever given to you in the question stem, therefore probably something you can eliminate. For instance, a large volume resuscitation greater than eight liters even if that is or isn't true, they didn't tell you how much the patient was at all resuscitated. So it would be an estimate and then therefore probably not the right answer. The same is true for a base deficit of greater than 10. There is a specific number by which we uh, consider patients better for damage control laparotomy and that's a base deficit of 15, but you didn't even need to know that in the question because they didn't tell you the base deficit. So really you were between A, D and E. And in this instance, uh, you can see that the trauma triad of death shows that hypothermia leads to coagulopathy, which leads to metabolic and so on and so forth around the circle. But according to the um, criteria set, I think it's East sets the criteria as far as the temperature it would have to be less than 34 degrees Celsius. The base deficit would be greater than 15. The, the pH would be less than 7.2, uh, 
and anything with ongoing venous or any bleeding that result in the coagulation cascade. And in this instance, that would be the answer E. So that's correct because that's the one that's creating the coagulation cascade that would result in um, damage control approach to minimize operative time. All right, next question. A 63-year-old woman with a history of insulin-dependent diabetes and refract refractory uh, atrial fib on digoxin presents with two weeks of progressive worsening nausea and vomiting. On admission, she has dry mucous membranes and mild sinus tachycardia. She's got an obstructing mass in the gastric antrum that's seen on CT scan, and she's admitted for resuscitation and workup. They haven't been able to get blood from her and the initial lab tests aren't sent. So later that day, she develops an arrhythmia, which leads to a cardiac arrest. Which of the following most likely contributed to her cardiac arrest? Answers are hypomagnesemia, hypovolemia, paradoxical aciduria, and renal excretion of potassium, intracellular shift of potassium from insulin, and decreased intake of potassium in the diet. So while you're thinking about this one, is the, is the question stem relevant to the question? And in this instance, I certainly think the question stem is relevant uh, to the question being asked. So that means some of your information is likely to come from the question stem. Oh, it's a little bit of a spread. All right. So with, with still a majority of you voting, you can see that most people pick the paradoxical aciduria and renal excretion of potassium. Um, so certainly one thing you can know is your, is your, uh, your nephrology, if you will. And with a gastric outlet obstruction, you're going to have nausea and vomiting. And that nausea and vomiting is going to result in not only dehydration, but um, hypokalemia, hyperchloremia, and a subsequent metabolic alkalosis. The, and, and that's pretty straightforward from the question stem. The, the part that you have to bring to the question is that when you have a metabolic alkalosis, you're trying to exchange sodium for potassium. You're trying to bring in more chloride to even out your pH, and in so doing, you're dumping potassium to do it. And that's why you get paradoxical aciduria and renal excretion of potassium, because you're trying to get rid of potassium to bring in more chloride to fix, quote unquote, the metabolic alkalosis as a result of your gastric outlet obstruction. Um, you can see there's other lists of causes of gastric outlet obstruction here. Um, that's uh, relevant to the test on the whole, although not specific to this particular question. And um, digoxin, as we all know, can result in some dysrhythmias um, and certainly um, the cause was the potassium, but the acting agent was probably the potassium in combination with the digoxin as to why she had cardiac arrest. And since digoxin was nowhere in the answer choices, you knew that wasn't a distractor. So we're a little over right. time, but this is a really high yield. So we're going to try to get through as many as we can in the next few minutes, right. okay? I'll go faster. All right. It's a 16-year-old boy who was car surfing, which is awesome, and uh, fell over and got hit by another vehicle. His GCS was seven. He was intubated and brought to the ER. But while he was being brought... To the ER, they found bilateral breast sounds, so they put in chest tubes. Uh, one chest tube put out 900 uh, milliliters and the other 250 milliliters of blood. On arrival to the hospital, the 16-year-old was hemodynamically normal uh, with a, an appropriate end tidal CO2. His uh, thromboelastography or TEG scan was performed. The R value of the TEG scan is significantly prolonged. The rest of the TEG parameters are normal. So what is the next most appropriate management for this patient? Um, erythropoietin, fresh frozen plasma, platelets, 
transexamic acid or cryoprecipitate. This is definitely a hot topic on the yeah, for sure. these years. For sure. And, and the interesting thing is you could get down to about a 50-50 shot at this question if you didn't even know what a TEG was. So, so keep that in mind. It, even if you knew what, what the answer choices do within the coagulation cascade, you can probably get pretty close even without a TEG. So it looks like most people pick the answer B, um, which is the correct answer, fresh frozen plasma. Um, but let's pretend like you might not even know what the tag is or, or entirely have it memorized and understand exactly how to interpret it. Um, it you know, during the coagulation cascade to resuscitate patients, uh, you've probably never seen anybody give erythropoietin um, in the acute phase. So you can get rid of that pretty much right off the bat, which leaves the rest of them. Um, you know, you have a patient who you have a patient who's a 16 year old boy and the primary blood loss here is whole blood, right? Um, and he basically, other than a prolonged R value, has otherwise normal hemodynamic parameters. And so you could you could probably get down to a few products and have a 50-50 chance. But that being said, the whole point of the question is really to highlight uh, TEG and it being an important topic for Absite. So reviewing TEG, in particular, the treatments based on the components of the thromboelastogram, like our time is one, usually cryo or the lice three or 30, I'm sorry. Those are usually the ones because those are the three different treatment options primarily that you'll see. So a prolonged R time gets FFP. Um, a K time uh, that's long gets cryoprecipitate uh, because there's uh, an issue with the fibrinogen and the lysine 30 time. If you have excess fibrinolysis, you need to stop the fibrinolysis, so this is antifibrinolytic, lysine is antifibrinolytic, and lysine is basically TXA. So if you even know that much, you can probably get, get by with that question, but it certainly means it's a, it's a hot topic. All right, next question. So you have a 26-year-old man who comes to the ER after being involved in a drive-by shooting. Uh, those two dudes again. Uh, he has multiple gunshot wounds to his left chest. In the trauma bay, he's unresponsive with a GPS of seven, a pulse of 125, a blood pressure of 78 over 40. And they start resuscitation, but then he becomes pulseless and apneic. What's the best next step in the management of the patient? Your answer choices are a clamshell thoracotomy, a medium sternotomy, an extended fast exam, a left anterolateral thoracotomy, and a place bilateral chest tubes. That didn't take long. I think, I think while the best, the best way to my heart is probably through my stomach. I think we all know the best way to a person's heart is through a left anterolateral thoracotomy. And that is largely a memorization question um, based on the fact that the patient becomes uh, hemodynamically unstable in front of you. That is summarized using East practice management guidelines for when to do a thoracotomy. Um, and you can see that highlighted here. Um, based on the mechanism of injury. So very rarely are you doing it for blunt trauma. You're primarily doing it for penetrating trauma. Um, and uh, more often than not, it is a conditional decision, except for the instance highlighted in this question where the answer is quite obvious as the only next best step. JB, I think um, that, next, yep. that next best step is so key to identify. You know, sometimes there's more than one right answer, but... You know, it's it's really important to know that what is the next best step is a common uh, question on the exam. And then we'll have time for, for sure. just one, one more question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a 21-year-old comes after being assaulted. He was stabbed in the left anterolateral flank above his 10th rib and kicked multiple times. He's stable, but a chest x-ray shows a pneumothorax. They put a left-sided chest tube in. It looks good. Just gets a few cc's of blood. And then he goes for a CT scan of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis. 
The chest tube's in a good place. His lung is fully expanded and he has a grade one splenic laceration. He's managed non-operatively and he's discharged four days later. Two months later, the patient comes back to the ER complaining of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and left-sided chest pain. He's got an elevated white count and a CT scan shows partial hernia herniation of his stomach through a left diaphragm hernia defect. What intervention should have been undertaken to rule out this complication? And the answer choices are exploratory laparotomy, exploratory laparoscopy, post posterolateral thoracotomy, anterolateral thoracotomy, or none, the patient was managed appropriately. This may, this may have people picking one or two. Let's see. No, no, no. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So um, the concern here is, is delayed diaphragm injury. Obviously, um, one potential way to rule out diaphragm injury in a hemodynamically stable trauma patient is to put a scope in their belly and or a scope in their chest or both um, to evaluate the area of trauma, especially when there's penetrating trauma, as in this case, um, but certainly in the fact that this has both penetrating and blunt trauma to multiple locations, meaning thorax and abdomen, um, that largely answers the question. I think most of the others are distractors, except maybe exploratory laparotomy. And the difference between that and the laparoscopy is that this is a delayed presentation and the patient at the time is hemodynamically stable. Your, your choice might be different if they would have given you the patient in a critical situation where you were trying to evaluate for diaphragm injury, you may choose exploratory laparotomy in such an instance. Dr. Bittner, I want to thank you so much for a tremendous overview of a very, very important and high yield topic on the app site. Excellent and thorough reviews. Really appreciate it. Uh, it gives me dis thank you. It gives me a distinct pleasure to introduce now um, another uh, panelist who has been um, a great part of our resident fellow training committee for several years and part of these sessions also. Uh, we invited her back for repeat performance because of her excellent shepherding of uh, this topic, which is in breast and endocrine. Dr. Amy Rosenbluth is in the Division of Bariatric uh, Forgot and Advanced GI and Surgery, an expert in all of those uh, fields, as well as surgery and, and critical care. She hails from Stony Brook Medicine in New York. Welcome, Dr. Rosenbluth. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. All right, so we're going to jump right in. A 45-year-old, otherwise healthy man, presents to the surgery clinic complaining of three months of intermittent severe watery diarrhea, muscle weakness, nausea, and lethargy. His exam is unremarkable. His lab work shows hypokalemia, high calcium, and a metabolic acidosis. Imaging shows a two-centimeter pancreatic tumor. What is the most common location of this tumor? A, head of the pancreas, B, neck of the pancreas, C, distal pancreas, D, evenly distributed throughout the pancreas, and E, the triangle formed by the common bile duct, neck of the pancreas, and the third portion of the duodenum. Something to consider you know, for this question is that it's actually asking you two things. First, it's testing if you can recognize what kind of tumor this is, and second, if you know where that tumor is located in the pancreas. All right, looks like most people got it, but there is some question. So this is a VIPoma. This is a pancreatic endocrine neoplasm. These are easy to test based on their symptoms. So knowing those sort of constellations of symptoms is important. So this is VIPoma is the watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, achlorhydria, and acidosis. VIPomas are most common in the distal pancreas. Head of the pancreas is typically a somatostatinoma, evenly distributed would be an insulinoma, and E is obviously a gastrinoma for the gastrinoma triangle. All right, another pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, 45-year-old man is diagnosed with one. Which of the following clinical scenarios is consistent with a glucagonoma? A, diarrhea and refractory peptic ulcer disease, 
B, fasting hypoglycemia, symptoms of hypoglycemia and symptom relief with glucose. C, watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, achlorhydria. D, anemia, weight loss, stomatitis, dermatitis, diabetes. E, steatorrhea, diabetes, cholelithiasis. Remember, sometimes when you are taking these tests, the question before or somewhere else in the test might help you with questions that show up later. So if we just went over something in the last question, it might help you with this one. All right. Pretty good. Um, so the answer is D. That is the common uh, symptoms that come with the gluconoma. Remember, we already talked about a VIPoma, which was C. A, peptic ulcer disease should tee you off to a gastronoma. B, insulinoma. Uh, and E would be a stomat somatostatinoma. Again, you can see how easy it is to just test based on symptoms. So these are a quick, easy way to get points. A 48-year-old woman is found on routine chemistry to have an elevated serum calcium of 10.8, which is confirmed by repeat lab testing. Additional workup shows the following values, 2.5 serum phosphate, 100 for serum chloride, 70 for parathyroid hormone, and 50 for 24-hour urinary calcium. Bedside ultrasound in clinic does not show any suspicious thyroid nodules or candidates for parathyroid glands, what is your next best step? A, focus parathyroidectomy. B, bilateral neck exploration. C, administer normal saline. D, observation. E, obtain ionized calcium level. Well, we've got some mixed results happening on this one. Okay, so the correct answer for this is observation. This is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So this is the inherited uh, form. The key to this question is knowing the difference between this and primary hyperparathyroidism. And you can note that from the 24 hour urinary urine calcium, if it's less than 100 over 24 hours, it's pointing you towards familial. And with that, you just need to observe. Um, the other main question, E, obtaining an ionized calcium, you don't need to do that. And the other main one was B, the bilateral neck exploration. Again, not needed for the familial form. Okay, which of the following statements regarding lobular carcinoma in situ is most correct. A, bilateral lesions occur less frequently in patients with ductal carcinoma in situ than patients with lobular carcinoma in situ. B, lobular carcinoma in situ occurs more frequently in African-American women than in other demographic groups. If C, if LCIS is identified in a biopsy sample, a mirror image biopsy of the other breast should be performed. D, invasive breast cancer develops in about 10% of patients diagnosed with LCIS or E, E, atypical lobular hyperplasia confers the same overall risk of developing invasive breast cancer as lobular carcinoma in situ. All right, a little bit of a mix happening with this one as well. So the correct answer is A. Remember when we're talking about LCIS, often we're talking about the concern for things being bilateral. So this um, is going to happen more frequently than in someone diagnosed with DCIS, which is A. Um, the other most commonly picked answer was D, um, invasive breast cancer developing in 10% of patients with LCIS. It's actually a 30% lifetime risk with that. Um, and the rest uh, had much less answers. All 
All right, which of the following is most consistent with need for a central duct excision? A, superficial mastitis, B, bloody nipple discharge after menopause, C, new onset breast abscess, D, bloody nipple discharge during pregnancy, or E, recurrent mastitis during breastfeeding. Dr. Rosenbluth, another kind of test-taking strategy on this one here. There could be more than one correct answer, but the question is asking for the most consistent. Absolutely. Always important to look at most consistent or next best step rather than just jumping to the thing that you think is most correct. All right. It looks like most people have it in and they are correct with B. Um, e is the next most common answer that you guys have picked, recurrent mastitis during breastfeeding. Actually, what we do there is um, antibiotics, DC breastfeeding, and a cancer workup for a recurrent mastitis. Um, when we're talking about um, most, you know, the most consistent need, the other op, the bloody uh, nipple discharge during pregnancy, in that case, you would probably try more to investigate the actual duct it's coming from. Um, that way you are not making uh, breastfeeding difficult or impossible. All right, a 34-year-old, sorry, 35-year-old, 24-week pregnant woman presents to the clinic with a diagnosis of invasive breast cancer, stage T2 with clinically negative nodes and a negative metastatic workup. The tumor is ERPR negative, HER2 negative. What is the next best step? in the management of this patient. A, a lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy. B, a lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy, chemotherapy, and delayed radiation. Lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy and breast radiation. D, mastectomy alone. Or E, modified radical mastectomy with breast radiation. I think this is also definitely a hot topic on most of the tests these days, the management of breast cancer in a pregnant patient. Absolutely. And I think uh, this one's an important one to think about too uh, for boards as well. Often they have questions on management like this or in counseling for uh, BRCA patients, which might be a question you see coming up. All right, it looks like most of you got this correct. The answer is B, lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy, chemotherapy, and delayed radiation. Um, so remember that you, you do need all three of these steps. Chemotherapy is safe after the second trimester during pregnancy. Um, radiation does need to be delayed until after birth. It's not safe for any, uh, any point during pregnancy. Um, D, if you were looking at mastectomy alone, you do still need a sentinel lymph node biopsy if you're doing a mastectomy, so that is why that would be incorrect. Oh, and also important, not stated in there, you do need to remember in pregnant patients, you cannot use methylene blue. Okay, that ha it has to be the radio tracer. Okay, 45-year-old woman undergoes a left partial mastectomy for a three-centimeter estrogen receptor positive ductal carcinoma in situ. Final path demonstrates a one-millimeter margin along the superior and inferior tumor borders. Which of the following is the next best step in treatment? A, administration of whole breast radiotherapy and endocrine therapy. B, re-excision to obtain two-millimeter margins followed by radiation and endocrine therapy. C, mastectomy alone followed by endocrine therapy. D, re-excision to obtain a three millimeter negative margin and sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by radiation and endocrine therapy. E, administration of systemic endocrine therapy alone. Not much debate in this answer.
All right, so the correct answer is B, re-excision. So when we're talking about DCIS, you need a two millimeter margin. There is no benefit to a three millimeter margin, so D is incorrect. C, again, if you're having a mastectomy, you're getting a sentinel lymph node biopsy, that needs to be there. Um, and you don't wanna do any steps until you get that two millimeter margin. A 41-year-old Caucasian woman comes to the clinic for evaluation after a recent core needle biopsy of the left breast demonstrated atypical ductal hyperplasia. Her past medical history is type 2 diabetes, well-controlled with diet and medication. She has a BMI of 25. Her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at 55. She asks about her risk of developing breast cancer. Which of the following is the strongest risk factor for the development of breast cancer in this patient? A, smoking history, B, Caucasian race, C, family history, D, atypical ductal hyperplasia, or E, weight. Remember, this is the strongest risk factor. This is another one of those questions where they may have multiple risk factors listed. You need to pick the one that confers the highest risk. Looks like not too much debate with this question as well. So the answer is atypical ductal hyperplasia. This is a three to five time fold risk. Um, family history can be a very high risk. Um, however, in the age of 55, that's actually just a 1.5 time higher risk. Um, you're looking for uh, premenopausal um, if, you're, if you're talking about a, a higher risk for breast cancer. I just want to add to they put in their smoking history, which is not in the STEM. So yeah. easy to rule out some of the answer choices. A 40 year old woman presents to the clinic after her primary care physician referred her for a prophylactic bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. She has known BRCA2 mutation after genetic testing following her sister's breast cancer diagnosis. The patient has two children and had a tubal ligation following her most recent delivery. Her last period was three weeks ago. She is otherwise healthy and has no surgical history. Uh, she understands her risks for various cancers due to BRCA2 mutation, but wants to know more about the benefit of prophylactic salpingo oophorectomy at this time. Which of the following is the most correct counseling at this time? A, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy should be performed before age 25 to confer a meaningful reduction in her risk of breast and ovarian cancer. B, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy does not have an impact on the patient's risk of future cancer. C, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy done now will reduce the risk of ovarian cancer, but not breast cancer. D, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy done now will reduce the risk of breast cancer, but not ovarian cancer. E, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy done now will reduce, will reduce the risk of ovarian cancer and breast cancer. It's a mouthful for that one. Not too much debate on this one either. The correct answer is E, um, that this will reduce the risk of ovarian cancer and breast cancer. The second most common choice you guys picked was C. This would be correct if we were talking about BRCA1. However, BRCA2 does show um, an improvement in risk for breast cancer if you have the bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. A 54-year-old woman undergoes modified radical mastectomy for inflammatory breast cancer after successful completion of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Which of the following nerves encountered during axillary dissection is correctly paired with the muscle it innervates? A, intercostobrachial, the pectoralis major. B, lateral pectoral for pectoralis minor. C, long thoracic for latissimus dorsi. D, medial pectoral, pectoralis major and minor. E, thoracodorsal for serratus anterior. Again, this is one of those no real trick to uh, answering this. This is just one of those gotta know it.
All right. And it does seem like most of you do know it. It is the medial pectoral innervating the pectoralis major and minor. A 48-year-old woman presents to your office with a thyroid nodule. On physical exam, the nodule is firm. There is no lymphadenopathy. An ultrasound with fine needle aspiration performed shows a, shows a 4.5 centimeter nodule in the right lobe. FNA uh, biopsy reports show intranuclear inclusion bodies and nuclear grooving on the specimen with calcified clumps of cells called somoma bodies. Based on these characteristic, characteristics, which operation would you recommend for this patient? A, a thyroid lobectomy, B, a total thyroidectomy, C, subtotal thyroidectomy, D, total thyroidectomy with bilateral neck dissection, and E, partial thyroidectomy and possible interval total thyroidectomy after pathology. This is another one of those questions that's testing, one, do you know what they're talking about? And then if you do know what they're talking about, do you know what goes into the management and the choices that you have to make? All right, and most of you did get that. The correct answer is a total thyroidectomy. This is papillary thyroid cancer. Um, it would be a lobectomy if it was less than four centimeters, but at 4.5, it should be a total. Which of the following patients needs breast biopsy? A, a 50-year-old woman with breast imaging, well, with a BIRADS-1 on routine mammography. B, a 35-year-old woman with atypical cells on cytology after FNA of a red indurated simple cyst with non-bloody fluid. C, a 65-year-old woman with a persistent palpable mass after FNA of serous fluid under ultrasound guidance. D, a 25-year-old woman with a well-circumscribed, firm, non-tender palpable mass that changes in size with her menstrual cycle. Or E, a 42-year-old woman with cyclical breast pain and a BIRADS-3. I think that BIRADS is sort of like the pancreatic endocrine tumors where if you know what that scoring system is, it can get you kind of an easy point because they can ask the questions a lot of different ways, kind of like this, knowing when you need a biopsy or not. It's like there is some debate on this one. The correct answer is C, a 65-year-old woman with a mass after you've FNA'd. So a persistent mass after aspiration should be a biopsy. Um, for B, the atypical cells, you should not really send for cytology if you get non-bloody fluid from a cyst. If it were bloody, then you can. It will often show an atypical cell if you send it. Um, and then for E, which was the other common choice answer, uh, BIRADS-3 should actually be short-term follow-up. A 30-year-old woman presents for her first prenatal appointment after positive pregnancy test two weeks ago. Her ultrasound confirms eight weeks gestational age. Incidentally, a thyroid mass is found on physical exam. Ultrasound shows a 1.5 centimeter hypoechoic nodule with microcalcifications on the left hemithyroid. The right hemithyroid is normal. There are no abnormal lymph nodes on either side. FNA shows papillary thyroid cancer. What is the most appropriate management of this patient? A, a hemithyroidectomy in the second trimester. B, total thyroidectomy immediately followed by radioactive iodine ablation after delivery. C, total thyroidectomy 12 months after delivery. D, total thyroidectomy immediately followed by radioactive iodine ablation in six weeks. Or E, serial ultrasounds of the neck. So far, we've got a interesting mix. I encourage you to read the stem carefully. Okay, 
So a lot of you went with A, but her uh, nodule is on the left hemithyroid. And so it's important to keep track of that when you are reading through the question. A right hemithyroidectomy in the second trimester would not be helpful for her. Um, serial ultrasounds of the neck is actually the correct answer. This is a well-differentiated cancer and studies have shown that you can safely ultrasound each trimester. Then after delivery, you can perform her thyroidectomy. Um, you never want to give radioactive iodine at any point during gestation. Thank you so much, um, Amy, for um, your topics. I would say breast and endocrine is a lot of memorization. I think that's fair to say. Um, so unfortunately, definitely some good um, test taking tips, um, but a lot of the kind of information you just have to memorize. So um, we are going to move on to the next section, which is the miscellaneous section. Um, Dr. Hennessy is going to be um, reviewing these uh, questions with us. She is an associate professor of surgery and director of the surgical ICU at UT Southwestern Medical Center. She has covered this topic for many years, um, and we are forever indebted to her for her depth of knowledge and for covering such a potpourri of questions. So thank you, Dr. Hennessy, for being back with us tonight. Let me just get your quiz set up. Okay, am I all set? Okay, um, we'll get started much like the other ones. If you guys have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer them as we go along. Um, the first question here is a 40 year old woman who is found to have an anterior mediastinal mass on CT of the chest performed as part of her trauma workup. What is the most common anterior mediastinal tumor? A, hemangioma. B, thymoma, C, lymphomas, D, germ cell tumor, and E, lymphangioma. It's a pretty straightforward question, so we'll see what folks say. Again, the most important things are kind of to highlight the age, the location, and that it asks for the most likely or most common. Great, so uh, looks like most everybody picked the right uh, right answer, B, thymoma. That is um, the most common tumor of the anterior mediastinum. That's just um, a memorization type question. Uh, the key things to remember and takeaways from this is that it can be seen with autoimmune diseases. Um, so those may be trigger words when you're reading a stem myasthenia gravis uh, specifically. Um, you only need CT imaging to diagnose it, uh, no MRIs, um, and that you really wanna avoid a needle biopsy of the lesion um, for uh, preventing any tracking. And that surgical resection is the best option um, for resection of these. Uh, question number two, which of the following is the primary fuel source for enterocytes? Glutam a, glutamate, B, glutamine, C, arginine, D, short-chain fatty acids, E, branch-chain amino acids. Again, this is one of those kind of strict um, potpourri uh, memorization type questions. You either kind of know it or you don't but a very common one. I think I've seen it almost every single year uh, on the app side or probably the written boards. Okay, so kind of the majority got the right answer, but a lot of people picked D. The correct answer is B, glutamine. And that is just, it is the primary fuel source um, for enterocytes. It's just something you have to know. Um, the um, all the other ones, the short chain fatty acids specifically, I know a lot of people pick that one, um, is the primary fuel source for the colon. So just don't get those two confused and keep them straight. Glutamine um, has been used um, in ICU 
uh, patients um, in times of significant um, stress and sepsis. It has been shown to decrease hospital length of stay, improve the nitrogen balance and decrease infection rates. Um, so maybe a take away uh, from this um, question other than glutamine being the answer. Question number three, which of the following is true regarding pulmonary sequestration? So we're all over the place with these questions. Um, a, conventional angiography is the study of choice to delineate the blood supply before surgical intervention. B, both intralobar and extralobar sequestrations are found more frequently on the left side. C, intralobar sequestration is often associated with other anomalies. D, intralobar sequestrations always have systemic blood supply, while extralobar sequestration always have pulmonary blood supply. And E, there is never bronchial communication. So maybe a little bit of a harder question. Um, we'll see how folks answer this one. I definitely had to reach way back into my ped surgery knowledge. It's been a while. It looks like a mix, but... <clears throat> so the correct answer is B. Uh, we'll first go over that. So pulmonary sequestration usually results from no communication with the bronchial tree. It has an anomalous uh, blood supply with the, from the systemic circulation. Um, extra low bar sequestration is more commonly associated with other anomalies. So both most commonly occur on the left side. I think the takeaway is one, you need to know about pulmonary sequestration. Um, don't forget uh, about that process in, uh, in children. It occurs most commonly on the left side. Um, there can be bronchial, um, some sort of anomalous bronchial communication. So the never should kind of key you into maybe that not being correct. Uh, um, C, intralobar sequestration is often associated with other anomalies. That's not correct because it's extralobar. Uh, A is not correct because you don't need angiography any longer to diagnose these. Our um, CT imaging um, is uh, improved significantly such that these can be adequately visualized and um, diagnosed through CT imaging. Dr. Hennessy, I would just add another test ticking uh, tip. You know, you notice question or answers D and E include the words always and mm -hmm. never. Um, and you, as we know in medicine, things are rarely that black and white, and so always and never kind of uh, clue you off that those those could uh, may not be the the correct answer. You notice question B includes more general terms, more frequently, often those kinds of things. That's right. Thank you for pointing that out. Question number four: A sixty-seven year old malnourished man with a history of scurvy is evaluated for chronic say, a chronic sacral wound that never completely healed despite aggressive therapy and wound back placement. Which of the following statements regarding the wound healing is true? A, glucocorticoids inhibit procollagen gene transcription, thereby leading to increased collagen synthesis. B, scurvy results in the prevention of aspartic acid hydroxylation. C, tensile strength of the wound is dependent on covalent collagen cross-linking. D, the proliferative phase, phase is characterized by increased vascular permeability, migration of cells into the wound by chemotaxis and secretion of cytokines. Or E, type three collagen is the principal collagen of skin. That was a mouthful. Um, this is really gonna be a test your knowledge type of question, um, it, there's probably not a lot of strategy um, in looking at the options to kind of eliminate things. It looks like maybe most people um, are picking some good answers here.
So it looks like the majority has picked um, C, which is correct. The tensile strength of the wound is dependent on covalent collagen cross-linking. Again, um, this is just one of those important things to know that the tensile strength is the most important factor in uh, wound healing, and it's dependent on collagen deposition and then cross-linking. Um, kind of other ways you can maybe kind of work through this question to figure it out if you don't exactly know it is that glu glucocorticoids do a lot more than just inhibit procollagen um, gene transcription. Uh, they have a lot of uh, different effects on collagen synthesis. Uh, um, going down to E, type three collagen um, is not the principal collagen of skin, it's type one. So knowing that might help you eliminate that as an answer. Um, but um, other than that, it's really, you know, knowing this information and in one of those memorization type questions. Yeah, something about wound healing in the phases is definitely tested on the app site every year too. Very common question. Okay. Um, question number five. A 55 year old woman with a history of renal transplant presents to the office with complaints of fatigue and weight loss. A CT scan of the abdomen shows evidence of widespread lymphadenopathy. Which virus is most closely associated with this disease? A, hepatitis C, B, herpes simplex virus, C, Epstein-Barr virus, D, HIV, or E, cytomegalovirus. So pay attention to the stem, uh, what the patient's history is, and that it's asking for the most likely. Okay, I think it seems like we have a clear majority. The correct answer um, is C, Ep Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. Uh, this diagnosis most certainly is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder or PTLD, um, which is uh, the most common type of cancer seen in post-transplant patients. Of course, any type of transplant patient can develop it and it's associated with being in an immunosuppressed state and allowing this virus um, uh, to lead to the development of lymphoma. The good ta takeaways here is to remember about PTLD, remember that what the treatment is, which is if it's mild, it can be monitored, but if it's a more severe case, they may need to be taken off their immunosuppressive medications and or treated with chemotherapy. Hepatitis C, of course, often we think about cirrhosis, um, and so that would eliminate that question. The um, uh, herpes simplex virus is often skin lesions or um, not listed um, here in the uh, explanation, but as well as encephalitis. Uh, HIV, uh, most commonly we see opportunistic infections with severe disease, uh, although cancer Kaposi sarcoma um, can be one of those, so to remember that. And then CMV can go, can cause um, mono, uh, but EBV is the most likely correct answer here. Okay, question six. A 52-year-old woman who suffered a 27% total body surface area burn is admitted to the Burn Center for Evaluation and Treatment. Evaluation reveals primarily uh, full thickness burns with overlying eschar. Appropriate resuscitation is conducted. The patient's wounds are covered with a topical antibiotic. Given these physical exam findings, which topical agent would best uh, be suited for this patient? A, silver um, sulfadiazine. B, methanidide uh, acetate. C, silver nitrate. D, neomycin. E, polymyxin B. So again, read the STEM carefully. Um, I don't know, when you guys take the app site, hopefully you still have this ability to kind of highlight keywords when you're taking the exam to remind yourself um, not to forget the 
how much percent body um, surface area burn there is, that it's uh, full thickness with an S-scar just to help guide you to the correct answer. Okay, looks like we're kind of between two, um, A and B. The correct answer is B, uh, methenonide uh, acetate. This is the correct answer because of all of the topical antibiotics. This one is the only one indicated uh, for full thickness burns with Escar. All of the other ones are the treatment uh, or potential treatments for partial thickness burns uh, without any Escar. And that's because they just cannot penetrate the Escar to be effective um, as antimicrobial agents. Uh, methenidide acetate um, is... Uh, quite painful in patients that don't have a full thickness burn, which is what limits its use. Uh, and one of the most common um, side effects uh, of the drug is metabolic acidosis. So um, something that you could very easily be tested on. All of the other options, A, C, D, and E, um, can all be used in partial thickness burns, um, depending on the location, uh, whether it's the face or other areas. Uh, and so that's what sets B aside from all of the other ones. So that's something to look for is to find, you know, in situations like this where any one of the answers seems like something you remember um, as a possible treatment uh, for burns is to determine, you know, which one of them sets it apart from everything else. And, and that's probably going to be a right answer. Question seven, a newborn infant develops projectile bilious vomiting soon after birth without abdominal distension on exam. Abdominal radiography shows a double bubble sign with both bubbles appearing to the right of the midline. After resuscitation, the most appropriate next step in management includes A, serial abdominal exams, B, administration of broad spectrum antibiotics, C, laparoscopic appendectomy and a uh, do we know um, do you know col colonic disassociation procedure or LADS procedure, duodenal duodenostomy or gastrojejunostomy? So, in looking at these questions, that are most appropriate next step. Um, remember that they've already implemented some management. They've already, already resuscitated the patient. So the next step is really, what are you gonna do um, to manage this finding? Looks like most of you got the correct answer, which is D, duodenal duodenostomy. The key here is picking up on this double bubble sign and that this patient has duodenal atresia. Uh, and once the patient is appropriately resuscitated, the next best step is uh, an operation. Um, the bilious vomiting, abdominal distension, the double bubble sign are most uh, suggestive of duodenal atresia. Um, so that should um, you know, kind of indicate um, to you what's going on. The fact that it's a newborn and not you know, six month old or a toddler that's coming in, uh, the serial exams and antibiotics may be something you know, that is not necessarily wrong, but it's not very helpful in management um, of what this infant has presented with. And the LADS procedure, of course, is the operative uh, intervention of choice for malrotation, not for duodenal atresia. Question eight. An 89-year-old woman with a history of a burn injury with excision and grafting to the left ankle 30 years ago presents with a new lesion over that area. It is four centimeters in size, has irregular borders, is dark uh, brown, and has a scaly appearance. A punch biopsy is performed and shows squamous cell carcinoma. How should this lesion be treated? A, observation, B, oral retinoids, C, wide local excision with a one millimeter margin, D, wide local excision with a four millimeter margin, E, wide local excision with a one centimeter margin.
again, the stem is helpful, but really it, the last line gives you the, the real question, um, which is that this is a squamous cell carcinoma. So how to best manage that. So it looks like most everybody picked wide local excision um, with varying margins. And this is knowing what margins you need on a squamous cell carcinoma, specifically because this was at a site of a burn <clears throat> for many years ago. It's a margillin ulcer, uh, which by definition is a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and it's quite rare, but happens at the site of chronic wounds, uh, which is important to remember. And that the treatment of this is excision with a, at least a 10 millimeter margin. So essentially one centimeter margin is the correct answer. The other two are um, the four millimeters is for basal cell carcinoma and one millimeter is just not sufficient uh, with regards to wide local excision. Question nine. A 16-month-old toddler is brought in by his mother who noticed an abrupt onset of irritability that began 12 hours ago associated with what she describes as projectile emesis. The patient has been afebrile without sick contacts. On examination, he is lethargic but not distended and with minimal focal tenderness over the right mid-abdomen. A mass is palpated in the right upper quadrant. Abdominal ultrasonography is obtained and is shown below. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? A, atropine infusion, B, CT of the abdomen, C, pneumatic reduction, D, pyloromyotomy, E, bowel resection. So much like the other questions, really pay attention to the stem, to the age uh, um, of the child that's presenting, because we could get pushed in one direction or another, um, particularly in the peds world, depending on what age of presentation is. Okay. So the correct answer um, is C. The diagnosis here is intestinal intussusception. Uh, and you can see on that ultrasound picture that there's a classic target sign uh, I've always called it a target sign and I've never seen it called a donut um, sign, but target or bullseye um, really describes that uh, intestinal intussusception. I think a lot of people may have, or the people that picked pyloromyotomy um, got pushed with a palpable mass uh, in a child. But remember, this was a 16 month old and not uh, a you know six week old, which makes a big difference. Uh, the treatment for intussusception, of course, um, is pneumatic dilation or pneumatic uh, reduction. I'm sorry. I'm thinking in my foregut world right now um, is pneumatic reduction. Uh, the most common site of intussusception, of course, is the ileum into the ileocecal valve. Um, and uh, the triad that most children present with is abdominal pain, palpable mass, and red uh, current jelly stools but this doesn't happen in everybody. And the um, age range is somewhere between three months and three years old. Of course, you can see this in adults and older children um, in those scenarios. Uh, there is of course concern that it may be more pathologic um, and malignancy associated. And so generally speaking, of course, we all know that in adults um, and into susception uh, kind of mandates um, surgical exploration, unless you have a very obvious um, potential explanation for it, like they've had a gastric bypass and they have an intussusception at the JJ. Uh, atropine, excuse me, atropine infusion, it would be the answer for somebody with a pyloric stenosis um, that uh, is not an operative candidate. Um, their ultrasound shows a target sign. Um, uh, sorry, their ultrasound does not show the target sign. Um, the CT scan is uh, will diagnose intussusception, but this can be easily diagnosed with ultrasound in children. And so of course that's the preferred method to avoid uh, um, radiation. And then pyloromyotomy is for pyloric stenosis and bowel resection is not uh, necessarily appropriate unless there is necrosis, uh, you know, ischemia perforation concern. Question 10, a study is conducted on patients with a new diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. 
the authors looked at the relationship between the size of the tumor and pathology and the level of um, CA199 at the time of surgery in patients who underwent operative resection. A correlation coefficient um, of one is found. Which of the following can be concluded from the data? A, an increase in the size of tumor causes an increase in CA199 by a variable amount. B, an increase in the size of the tumor causes a decrease in CA199 by a fixed amount. C, a weakly positive correlation for every one centimeter increase in tumor size, there is a variable proportional increase in CA199. D, a strongly positive correlation for every one centimeter increase in tumor size, there is a fixed proportional increase in CA199. And then E, no correlation between tumor size or CA199 level exists. So as you guys are answering this question, uh, this is just a reminder to everybody that statistics um, is a fair game on the app site. And there are um, every year, I think there are, you know, at least a couple questions on statistics. So just an area not to forget about um, and to understand like sensitivity, specificity, uh, correlation coefficient, and kind of the key buzz terms um, are things that you just, you had just need to know them. So it looks like uh, the majority have picked D, which is the correct answer, a strongly positive correlation for every one centimeter increase in tumor size, there's a fixed proportional increase in CA199. It's just the definition of what a correlation coefficient is, a very strong positive relationship, uh, which means that for every positive increase in one variable, there's a positive increase um, a positive fixed increase in another variable. Uh, none of the other options fit that definition um, of a correlation coefficient of one. Question 11, a five-year-old presents with a midline neck mass that has been present for 10 weeks. On examination, the mass is three centimeters in size, is not tender to palpation and is not pulsatile. Basic labs, including thyroid function tests are normal. What is the most appropriate imaging for the diagnosis of this patient? A, MRI scan of the neck. B, radioactive iodine uptake test. <laughs> Excuse me, C, plain films of the neck. D, CT scan of the neck. E, ultrasound of the neck. It's like this is going to be a one where we have strong majority. Okay, so E is the correct answer, ultrasound of the neck. Uh, important again to pay attention to the stem. This is a five year old, not a 50 year old, um, and previously healthy labs are normal. So the um, Ultrasound of the neck is the right answer, and most likely this five-year-old has a thyroglossal duct cyst of the neck. Um, labs are important. Thyroid function tests are important um, to uh, make sure that there's adequate thyroid function. The ultrasound needs to look at the cyst, but also look at the thyroid tissue to make sure that it's an appropriate position uh, before talking about any sort of resection. In terms of the other answers, uh, CT, MRI, a little aggressive and in initial imaging. Uh, plain films is not going to demonstrate or give you any information about a cyst. And the radioactive iodine uptake test um, can be used to locate the thyroid, um, but it's not appropriate in the pediatric uh, patient population. Um, remember that thyrodos, thyroglossal duct cysts remember, require a cistern, cistern trunk excision, which is the cyst, the entire tract, and the hyoid uh, bone to prevent res uh, recurrence um, of the site. So you can't just remove the cyst. Question 12. Um, I like how we're flip-flopping between uh, you know, very young patients and very old patients. Well, 66 is not old though. Um, a 66 year old woman is being treated with a nitroprusside drip to control her blood pressure. She begins to complain of weakness and dizziness. The patient becomes notably confused and has an increased work of breathing. 
which of the following is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? A, sodium nitrite, B, uh, N-acetyl um, cysteine or NAC, C, thiocyanate, D, um, succimir, E, naloxone, sorry. This is really a paying attention to the STEM and remembering most of the things that happen to patients, or at least half of them are I iatrogenic things we've done. Okay, so looks like an even uh, mix here. The correct answer um, is A. Um, am I reading that correctly? Yeah. So it, what we're really identifying here is that the patient has cyanide toxicity from the nitroparoside. Um, and that is a um, rare... Uh, um, sorry, I'm looking at the poll now. Actually, most people pick C, it looks like. Um, it is a very rare but real complication of nitroprusside drip, which is why you don't want to use it for more than depending on your institution. But I would say 48 hours, you really need to switch to some other towards a uh, type of blood pressure management drug. Um, it's identifying the fact that this is uh, cyanide toxicity secondary to the nitroprusside medication, knowing what those side effects are. Um, the answer C, thiosanate, is the level that you check for cyanide toxicity. Um, so that's not a treatment, it's diagnosis of it. Um, and uh, the, um, of course, B, NAC, is to treat um, Tylenol toxicity. Uh, D um, is the right uh, drug for lead poisoning, if I remember that correctly. Um, in the pediatric uh, um, population. And then uh, E naloxone, of course, is for opioid um, overdose and not cyanide toxicity. Okay, 13. Um, a mother brings her three week old male infant into the emergency department with a one week history of bilious vomiting, progressive abdominal distension. In addition to an abdominal x-ray, a contrast study is obtained, which is shown below. The patient is resuscitated appropriately. Which of the following is the most appropriate to me next step in management? A, upper GI contrast study, B, pylor myotomy, C, LADS procedure, D, rectal suction biopsy, E, laparoscopic colonic mapping. So make sure you really pay attention to the type of imaging this is and the stem of the patient. Okay, looks like we have a majority, uh, which is um, the correct answer, which is D, rectal suction biopsy. This is identifying the fact that what you're looking at here in this picture with this presentation is Hirschsprung's disease. This is of course a rectal contrasted study. Um, this is not an, uh, an upper GI study. Uh, it, um, Hirschsprung, knowing Hirschsprung's disease, um, what it is, the fact that it's an aganglionic segment, um, typically of the sigmoid colon, you could see on that picture an area of narrowing and then proximal dilation, which is classic. Um, the definitive diagnosis for this is the next best step, um, which is um, the rectal suction biopsy to identify that there are no ganglion cells in this segment. Uh, C, LADS procedure, of course, is for malrotation. B, pyloromyotomy is for pyloric stenosis, other, other, other you know, foregut. An upper GI contrasted study would um, not really be helpful. Again, it's another test and not kind of next best. Uh, and then I think E, laparoscopic colonic um, 
mapping is once you have the diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease on the rectal uh, suction biopsy, then uh, colonic mapping is done to identify um, where the transition zone is. All right, last question. Uh, a 25 year old man is transferred for my section. Sorry. Um, a 25 year old man is transferred to the hospital from an outside facility. The patient was assaulted and stabbed in the middle of his back. A CT scan from the outside hospital shows a thoracic spine injury involving only half of the vertebral body and likely only part of the spinal cord. An MRI has been ordered. Which of the following neurologic findings is most consistent with this diagnosis? A, a contralateral loss of motor control, the level of the injury, an ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, one to two levels distal to the injury. B, ipsilateral loss of motor at the level of the injury and contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, one to two levels distal to the injury. C, contralateral loss of motor, one to two levels distal to the injury and contralateral loss of pain and temperature at the level of the injury. D, ipsilateral loss of motor, one to two levels distal to the injury, ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature at the level of the injury. E, bilateral loss of motor and sensation at the level of the injury greater in the upper extremities compared to the lower extremities. So the key, I think, to this question is very quickly identifying uh, in the stem. It gives you a lot of clues and hints about the fact that this is um, only half of the vertebral body and likely only part of the spinal cord type injury, and it's a penetrating injury. And just then knowing what the neurologic sequelae are. So it looks like most people picked B, which is the correct answer. brown saccard syndrome, which is ipsilateral loss of motor control and contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. Um, so just knowing that is important to getting this answer right. And it's just one of those memorization things that you need to know. Um, all of the other ones um, are incorrect uh, for one reason or the other, because it doesn't fit this. Really that like half vertebral body and half spinal cord injury is what um, should lead you to um, think about brown saccard syndrome. It's of course injury, uh, incomplete injury pattern with hemisection of the cord happens more commonly with uh, penetrating injuries uh, than blunt injuries. And then I think can happen with some like infectious um, or tumor um, type findings, but very uncommon for it to be like from an MVC or a fall, for instance. Dr. Hennessy, thank you so much for that um, amazing review of a disparate number of uh, topics that continue to be just flabbergasted by your wealth of knowledge. And that's why we keep asking you back every year. So thank you so, so much. And another person whose brain I'd like to transplant to my own, Dr. Vipul Katarpal. Uh, Vipul is a good friend and colleague of mine uh, here at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Dr. Katarpal is a vascular surgeon specializing in endovascular and minerally invasive advances in peripheral vascular disease and complex aortic pathology. Again, a repeat um, a faculty member due to his um, uh, just phenomenal uh, mastery of the content. Uh, Vipul, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me again. Good evening, everyone. So now to the last section for the night. So we'll start. We have 10 questions that we have to get through in 15 minutes. So we'll start promptly. Which of the following is an absolute contraindication to thrombolytic treatment in a 64-year-old female who came in with massive PE? A, HIT, B, heparin drip, C, intracranial neoplasm, D, spinal surgery within the last four months, or E, diabetic hemorrhagic retinopathy? So essentially, every patient you evaluate uh, who needs thrombolytic treatment, whether that be acute limb ischemia, a stroke or a massive PE, you always have to think through the problems uh, that they present with and determine what kind of contraindications they have to thrombolytic therapy, which can make things worse. So 
So the correct answer for this problem as more than just more than half of you have suggested as C, which is intracranial neoplasm. So a lot of people have answered D and E. So spinal surgery four months ago is not an absolute contraindication because generally uh, the threshold for that is about two to three months for any recent stroke, major trauma, uh, spine surgery. Uh, it's generally two months or three months uh, time limit. If you have any uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled uh, or uncontrollable clotting disorders, severe allergic reaction, or active bleeding, then you absolutely cannot have TPA. In life-threatening situations like massive PE, in some select cases, uh, you may consider thrombolytic treatment, but having diabetic retinopathy that is hemorrhagic is just an, a relative contraindication in those cases. Second question, uh, patient comes to your office after noticing a mass in the left side of the neck. He's asymptomatic and his vital signs are fine. You get a CT angiogram which shows a three centimeter hypervascular tumor that sits at the carotid bifurcation. This patient should be managed with A, observation until tumor reaches five centimeters, B, angioembolization and repeating a CT scan in two weeks, C, aminoglutamide for six weeks, D, excision of tumor, or E, radiation therapy. So the stem pretty much asks for us to, first of all, identify what this tumor is, and then look at the size of the tumor, and then determine what the next best steps would be for treatment. So as, as you guys probably guessed, the vast majority of people answered this question, uh, identifying the tumor correctly as a carotid body tumor, which is a paraganglionoma, which always occurs at the site of the carotid bifurcation. It is a very slow grow, growing, a growing tumor that encases the carotid artery, um, especially the external. Rarely does it involve the internal carotid artery where you require any kind of reconstruction. All of these require excision. So anyone who is fit to have surgery should have excision of the tumor. For tumors which are larger than three centimeters, we get them embolized uh, the day prior to excision of uh, these tumors and rapidly do it. We normally don't wait two weeks to see resolution. Um, radiation therapy is reserved for patients who are not good candidates for open surgery. A 69-year-old male with a 5.7 centimeter AAA underwent an open repair. Post-op, he developed paraplegia of lower extremities. Which of the following is correct regarding this complication? A, the most common mechanism is ischemia from hypotension during surgery. B, paraplegia is more common after infrarenal AAA repair. C, paraplegia is extremely rare after a type 4 thoraco repair. D, paraplegia is reversible. E, maintaining prograde flow through internal iliac arteries may minimize these, this complication. Mm. So you have to remember, there are two main complications, right, in the stents for AAA repair. One is intestinal ischemia, and the other one is paraplegia. The mechanism for these two is a little bit different. So the correct answer for this question is E, which is maintaining uh, anti-grade flow through hypogastric arteries prevents uh, this complication. So anytime we're doing any sort of AAA repair, whether that's open or endo, we try to maintain good perfusion to the spine. So as you know, there are a lot of collateral pathways, how spine um, gets fed, whether that be lumbars or hypogastrics or subclavian, et cetera. So anytime you're doing any sort of repair, you want to make sure that you at least keep one hypo open at the end of the repair to prevent this complication. The odds of having this paraplegia complication after an infrarenal AAA repair is extremely rare, less than a percent. So it's like 0.25%. Uh, 
generally after a type four thoraco, the num the number is still in low single digits, so it's ex it's not very common, but it still exists. So we always put lumbar drains in when we're doing type four thoraco repairs. Paraplegia is generally permanent when this happens, and oftentimes it's a result of embolization or thrombosis of multiple lumbar arteries leading to spinal infarcts. It is not generally due to hypotension, as is the case with intestinal ischemia. Which compartment of the lower leg is most susceptible to compartment syndrome? A, anterior, B, lateral, C, superficial posterior, D, D posterior, and E, medial. This is a very relevant uh, question, even in clinical practice, uh, because whenever you suspect compartment syndrome, you have to start evaluating this compartment carefully. When you see these patients, not all of them will come with the five Ps that you expect. So you need to evaluate this compartment in particular whenever you are concerned about compartment syndrome. So the correct answer is A and T here. So anytime you're concerned about compartment syndrome, you almost always go and palpate the anterior compartment. You dorsiflex and plantar flex the foot and ask them if they're tender in the anterior compartment or feel for tenderness in the anterior compartment. Anterior compartment happens to be uh, surrounded by the most rigid fibrous and osseous boundaries leading to uh, and lead, making it most prone to uh, compromise with increased uh, compression. The lateral compartment, while it is similarly tightly bound on all sides, ju generally just has a superficial peroneal nerve running through it. So you don't generally get arterial compromise. So anterior compartment palpation and evaluation with dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and palpation is most important. Out of all the compartments, superficial posterior compartment is the least susceptible to compartment syndrome because it's not that tightly bound. There are no big neurovascular structures running through it and there is no medial compartment. So that eliminated that option E altogether. The posterior compartment can be compromised leading to compromise of the posterior tibial artery and the tibial nerve, but generally it's a large compartment. So that is not the first compartment to go when you're evaluating these patients. A 63-year-old male undergoes cardiac catheterization and develops a pulsatile mass near the femoral artery puncture site in the right groin. You get a duplex, which shows an eco-lucent mass near the femoral artery and a channel with arterial flow into this mass. He's planned for a thrombin injection into the pseudoaneurysm. Which of the following is a technical consideration? A, should be injected in multiple sessions. B, not effective in patients on anticoagulation. C, indicated for pseudoaneurysms less than two centimeters in size. D, performed under angiographic guidance. Or E, identifying the pseudoaneurysm by the swirling flow in the cavity. So the stem already kind of tells you that it's a pseudoaneurysm and the next step is you have to figure out which of these is true. Like, is identifying it that important? Do you do it under angiographic guidance or ultrasound guidance? Do you do it uh, for sizes less than or more than two centimeters? And should you consider thrombin injections on patients who are on antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation, which is a vast majority of them? So most of you have answered correctly, which is uh, E. So you identify these pseudoaneurysms with swirling uh, of blood inside the pseudoaneurysm cavity. And you're also looking for a to and fro motion at the pseudoaneurysm neck on ultrasound. So identifying it correctly is very important. Once you identify it for pseudoaneurysms more than two and a half centimeters, you offer those patients thrombin injection for sizes less than two and a half centimeters, the vast majority of them spontaneously resolve within the first two weeks. You do it most often in more than 93% of patients in a single session, and you inject the pseudoaneurysm dome where you see active flow with thrombin, and you give thrombin very, very slowly to prevent any thromboembolization into the native circulation. 
For uh, patients who are on anticoagulation, there is no contraindication to trying thrombin first because you're just simply trying to clot the pseudoaneurysm cavity off and doing open surgery on patients who are on full anticoagulation can be even messier. 55-year-old man underwent an endovascular repair of a 5.5 centimeter symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysm. On surveillance, you noted contrast flow outside the lumen of the endograft coming from the lumbar arteries, but without any evidence of aneurysm sac enlargement. What is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? A, balloon expansion of the proximal and distal attachment sites. B, continuous monitoring with serial imaging. C, placement of a balloon expandable stent. D, transarterial coil embolization. E, direct translumbar aortic embolization. So first of all, you have to figure out what kind of endoleak they're talking about, and then figure out what is normally done for that endoleak. I think most of you have gotten this question correct, answered this question correctly, which is, uh, serial monitoring uh, with CT scan imaging or ultrasound imaging. And essentially you're talking about a type two endoleak, which is a retrograde flow into the aortic sac from lumbars or IMA. As long as the sac size remains stable, type two endoleaks are benign and do not warrant any sort of intervention, which was option D and E, where you go in directly through a sac puncture to embolize them, or you do transarterial coil embolization. Type The first option that 3% people, or nobody picked here, is for type 1 endoleak, which is a proximal or distal attachment leak around the endograft, which always requires an intervention. Type 3 endoleak is when the components of the endograft come apart, which also always requires an intervention. 78-year-old woman who lives alone undergoes XLAP with bowel resection for strangulated ventral hernia. Surgery was long. It took six hours, and EBL was 200 ml. She's hemodynamically stable and was started on sub-Q heparin on post-op day two for DVT prophylaxis. On day five, she was found to have left leg swelling, and ultrasound showed popliteal vein thrombus. She's otherwise stable and has had return of bowel function. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? A, initiate anticoagulation with IV heparin, followed by three months of anticoagulation, B, start heparin and do 12 months of anticoagulation, C, anticoagulation with IV heparin and then lifelong anticoagulation, D, IVC filter placement, E, continue sub-Q heparin and re-image prior to discharge. Most of you answered this co correctly. Uh, most of you have answered this incorrectly. No. They just started the poll. They just started the poll. For a second, yeah. I thought it said 100% answered. So most of you have answered it correctly, which is A, you start anticoagulation and do three months of anticoagulation. She is post-op day five uh, from a long surgery, which is what likely caused her to have a DVT. So she had a provoked DVT. The treatment for provoked DVT, as long as you can tolerate anticoagulation, is to do anticoagulation for at least three months. For certain select patients, you have to do treatment longer than three months if they have had a prior DVT or if they have any underlying um, hypercoagulable states. If you do not have any inciting factor that led to a DVT, this often requires workup with more prolonged anticoagulation, whether that be um, lifelong or uh, a defined amount of time, uh, depending on the etiology. IVC filters are not benign and should be reserved for patients who really cannot tolerate anticoagulation and every effort should be made to remove them. 36-year-old otherwise healthy man presents with acute onset left leg pain. He has past medical history for COVID pneumonia two weeks prior. On exam, left leg is cool with no palpable pulses and diminished sensations. On right, the leg is warm with easily palpable pulses. EKG shows sinus tachycardia and vitals are stable. 
you get a CT scan that shows isolated occlusion of left popliteal artery with reconstitution of flow at the level of distal tibial vessels with no other findings on CT, angiogram, chest, abdomen, pelvis. What is the most likely etiology of the finding? A, atherosclerosis, B, cardiac source, C, free floating aortic thrombus, D, DIC, and E, endotheliitis. All right, so most of you, have, half of you have answered this correctly. Uh, so most common pathophysiology in COVID-19 infection leading to uh, hypercoagulable states is uh, endothelial dysfunction and inflammation leading to a hypercoagulable state and focal thrombosis. In this particular case, uh, some of you have answered the cardiac source, but the guy is relatively young. He's 36 years old. There's no mention of atrial fibrillation, or an echo finding. So we have no reason to believe that it would be a cardiac source. While we do see free floating aortic thrombus and mural thrombus quite a bit in COVID-19 infections, that was not found on the CT scan uh, based on the findings which are given. So most common cause for this in this particular patient is primary throm thrombosis due to endothelial dysfunction and inflammation. 35-year-old woman who was recently admitted to the hospital uh, for several days, presented to the ER with swollen and palpable red co cord over left medial cubital vein, where she had a recent peripheral IV catheter. She's febrile to 38.5 degrees Celsius with elevated white count and positive blood culture for staph aureus. What is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? A- oral ampicillin sulbactam, B, IV vancomycin and ceftriaxone, C, anticoagulation with heparin, D, fundoparinox with IV vancomycin and ceftriaxone, or E, IV vancomycin, ceftriaxone, and excision of the infected segment. So this is one of those stems where you have to say, I have to read the examiner's mind. While more than one option may be suitable, you have to find the most suitable option between the two. So as most of you uh, have answered this question, the correct answer is E. So the patient presented with sepsis with elevated white count positive blood cultures. The patient has suppurative thrombophlebitis. If it is very common to have thrombophlebitis in superficial veins after peripheral IVs, most of which are managed just with compression, warm compresses, NSAIDs, etc. It's very rare to even give fundoparinux for these patients. In this particular case, however, they presented with sepsis, so the most definitive treatment would be broad-spectrum IV antibiotics covering both MRSA and gram negatives with vancomycin and ceftriaxone, followed by excision of the vein for source control. Last question, 75-year-old man with, an, with a known abdominal aortic aneurysm and a history of poorly controlled diabetes presents with fever, back pain, and a pulsatile abdominal mass that is tender. He is found to be febrile with elevated white count and a high ESR. Which of the following organisms is most likely causing this infection? A, E. coli, B, fungi, C, Neisseria species, D, salmonella, or E, Staph aureus. So the correct answer is E. So most common, so first of all, you have to identify the problem. So the patient is coming in with a mycotic aneurysm. Right. So the most common cause of infected abdominal aortic aneurysm is a staph aureus followed by salmonella. Staph aureus re represents more than 60% of these patients who show up. The treatment for them is obviously excision, debridement, and reconstruction, uh, oftentimes with native tissue using uh, femoral veins. Sometimes we use cryografts or rifampin-soaked grafts to treat them. Um, 
having infection with a gram negative uh, bug like salmonella can oftentimes lead to sudden expansion of aortic uh, saccular aneurysms that are that have far worse prognosis than just the staph mycotic aneurysm alone. All right, I think that concludes it. Dr. Katarfal, thank you very, very much again uh, for the phenomenal overview of a, a very important uh, topic on the app site. I uh, really appreciate your expertise. I'd like to invite all of the panelists back to join us for our farewell. Um, I want to, again, thank all of the panelists for their phenomenal uh, contributions, for being a part of this uh, annual uh, program, which reaches so many uh, participants throughout the the, really throughout the world. Um, I want to thank all of uh, you who are tuning in to us uh, this afternoon, this evening, or wherever you are, uh, for being a part of this uh, annual tradition through SAGES and the Resident Fellow Training Committee, um, a phenomenal organization that um, really provides resources to trainees at all stages of their education, um, including this program, as well as many others. We hope to see you in Cleveland in April of this year. Uh, please consider joining SAGES if you're not already to take advantage of this and many other resources that we provide. In the meantime, we wish uh, you all good luck for those who are taking the app site in uh, just a few weeks. Uh, we know it can be a stressful exam, but hopefully with today's session and others, you'll be well prepared. Uh, today's session is recorded and it will be available to you on the SAGES TV YouTube channel in the next few days. The December session is already available um, and you can check it out again on SAGES TV YouTube channel. Um, over 2,400 views already in the last three weeks. So very, very popular uh, session. I want to thank especially Dr. Haskins, my co-host, for all her uh, work in preparing uh, for these sessions. I want to thank TrueLearn. Uh, for their um, the contribution of the questions which elevated the quality of the, the sessions this year. In the meantime, thank you all. Thank you to our SAGES staff for putting this on and um, uh, running the ship so smoothly. Please be safe, take care, and have a, a joyous and successful 2024. Have a good night.